I was called the changing of the guard. That's what it is. Crisis which we face, the health crisis uh, during the pandemic, which really narrowed our recognition on who our friends were and who they are. If you look at any of the nation states during the pandemic, they can tell you that they have received assistance from India. All of us need strong multilateral order. The big beasts of the jungle also need it. If you look at development assistance, you look at the small states, they can tell you India has always been providing leadership without the Time magazines and the, you know, and the CBS, none of that. India has been taking care of its people and the rest of the world. This was a scarce resource which everyone needed at the same time and in massive scale. Mm. You needed friendship. Who could you call? And more importantly, who would answer? India answered. If you look at what you've gone through with the pandemic, you look at the conflict in Ukraine and the G20 presidency, India has emerged as a powerful leader and policy maker. And people are following, countries are following, because everyone wants the world to be a better place. I think if you're part of the Global South, you know it. Let's move to uh, the main conversation we are hosting this evening. Uh, I am delighted to um, uh, welcome on stage uh, the Indian External Affairs Minister, Dr. S. Jay Shankar, um, Minister, for Gaya, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Guyana, Hook Tilton Todd, uh, Ms. Kamina Johnson Smith, Minister from Jamaica, and of course, Minister Cravino from Portugal. Can I request you to come on stage? So, as everyone gets mic'd up, and I'm sure some mic will miraculously appear for me as well, <laughs> let me acknowledge a few. Um, folks in the audience who've uh, taken the effort to be here with us. I can see Ricky here. So Ricky Cage, Grammy Award winner. He's with us this evening. Thank you for joining us, Ricky. Uh, uh, let me also acknowledge the presence of His Excellency Ahmed Khalil, Minister of State from Maldives. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And in, in his absence, but I'm sure he's going to be with us soon, is uh, His Excellency Khalifa Shaheen. Uh, Minister of State from the UAE. So we'll have some folks in the audience who will try to bring into the conversation as well. So Ricky, you're, I'm going to come to you. Don't ask them to sing, but you can ask them to really sing. Minister Jayashankar, let me start with you, sir. Okay. Normally, I come to you last, but today I want to start with you first. 36 hours in the city? Uh, less than, yeah, about. About 20, minister, 20 ministerial meetings? Or 20, how many how ministers have you met till now? Mm, yeah, getting there. <laughs> <laughs> What's the readout? What is the response to what has happened in Delhi in the month of September? The G20 communique, the parliament decision, the bold decision to reserve one third seats in the Indian parliament, walking the talk, making women led growth the centerpiece of your presidency, and then doing it in the Indian parliament a week later. What's been the feedback to you? Uh, on the G20, I would say partly depends who you are talking to. Uh, a lot of folks were still surprised that we actually got everybody together. Uh, I don't think they completely expected that. Uh, so uh, there'll be one set of people who are still wondering how that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part, which uh, I think includes some people with me here now, uh, is uh, really, uh, I think, uh, uh, appreciation that we got the G20 to focus on the Global South, uh, that uh, the job for which the G20 was created, which was uh, global growth and development, we got them to refocus on it, uh, and with particular attention to the Global South. Uh, and we did that partly by, by you know, organizing a Global South uh, Summit uh, uh, in advance. So uh, I think uh, th that would be my answer regarding the impressions uh, on the uh, on the legislation in the constitutional amendment actually which was just passed two days ago by the Indian Parliament uh, which uh, uh, which essentially reserves one-third of the seats 
in our lower house and our provincial assemblies for uh, women. Uh, uh, you know, and again, people are waking up to it. Uh, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of interest. In fact, uh, Kamina and I were just discussing it before mm -hmm. we came in. Uh, the Prime Minister of Samoa and I were discussing it at our previous meeting. Uh, I think a lot of countries are curious. Uh, in, you know, I had a chat about it with the Egyptian Foreign Minister because they also uh, do something similar. So how do you implement it, particularly in a Westminster uh, model uh, system? So there's a lot of uh, uh, interest uh, in all of that. So. Uh, definitely a sense that, uh, you know, uh, things are happening in India, with India, by India. So, that's really... Uh, Please, I want to ask you one more question before I sir. go to the others. You used the word Global South a few times uh -huh. in your opening intervention. I've just traveled through Europe to reach New York. It was a long route. There were a few European countries who want to join the Global South. You have talked up the Global South so much that people say there's this new club in town, Global South. Like, is, is it no, a no, lounge? They're, they're welcome. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, my, but on a serious note, yes. what is Global South? Because, you know, they ask me and I, 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 kind of, I kind of wing it, but can you tell us now so that I can use it later? You know, uh, it's one of those, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very Indian thing, it's ambiguous. Uh, and uh, you, you, uh, you, you can have a clear sense when you want to have one. Uh, I think there's a clearly a sense of history there. Uh, much of the global south come from a world that was colonized. There's a sense of geography. I mean, it's physically a lot of it is in the south, but not all countries in the south are part of the global south. I think there's also a mindset. Mm. Um, so uh, the global south has a is an expression in a way of a certain solidarity and. Uh, uh, generosity and uh, sort of a sharing spirit. Uh, of a community. Uh, a com yes, yes. So it's, uh, uh, it's uh, I, I, I think if you're part of the Global South, you know it. You don't need to define <laughs> yeah. it. So. True. Okay, uh, so I, actually a few in Europe know it. Uh, 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 and actually uh, they also justified to me that they are South of Europe, so they are Global South. <laughs> <laughs> so let me turn to the South of Europe now. So, uh, you know, uh, I, was, I, I was thinking about it, uh, Ambassador, uh, Minister, sorry, he was Ambassador in India, so my, my apologies, Mr. Cravino. I was actually thinking about it. The Portuguese were perhaps the first Indo-Pacific empire in a, in a different era. The people who understood the importance of the Indo-Pacific in some ways, who straddled both the oceans um, and, and uh, built their uh, networks there. But today, many, many centuries later, Many in the same part of the world would actually find Portuguese far more empathetic and far more relatable to amongst the Europeans. In fact, some people told me, can't we have more of Port Portugal in Europe and we might be able to do business with them. <laughs> so uh, what is it that countries in Europe are today doing to respond to this new moment where the South is expecting a certain new kind of partnership, a new sort of relationship with the developed world, with the uh, erstwhile colonizers, with rich economies, whichever way you want to frame it. Is Europe responding to this moment? Are they cognizant of it? Or are they only desperate for them to agree to the European positions on certain other issues? Mm. No, absolutely. It's a very interesting point because I've uh, been in this current position for a year and a half and I have seen some, uh, some transformation. Um, firstly, let me be clear, Portugal is the south of the north. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I'd like to also make another uh, suggestion before addressing directly the point that you raised, which is I'm more attracted, I must say, to the notion of plural South. Mm. Paradoxically, the idea of plural South, because of, the, of course, the heterogeneity that exists uh, across the planet, that actually helps to focus on what unites, on what brings together, what is it that this, all these different regions, countries have in common. And there we would find, I believe, uh, apart from this notion of community, also a sense that the institutions that govern our hmm. times need to be adjusted to reflect the rising South, which in itself, of course, is not homogeneous either. There are parts of the South which, unfortunately, are sinking literally with rising sea levels in the Pacific mm -hmm. or, uh, or with institutional collapse in, in parts of Africa. But, but I digress. I think that 
with respect to the point that you ask about uh, whether Europe is more, European countries as a whole, are more capable of listening and interacting. A year and a half ago, of course, we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And within two or three months, many of my colleagues, we meet regularly and once a month in, in the European Union, many of my colleagues were saying, we need outreach, outreach, outreach. There was, of course, a very instrumental purpose, instrumental approach, which is we need outreach in order for uh, other countries to condemn Russia the same way as we do and so on. And uh, that has happened, 141 countries voting in the same way in the United Nations and so on. But above all, what has happened in this year and a half is a move to from the purely instrumental approach to Hang on, that means actually we do have to start listening a bit better and understanding what the problems are from a perspective of the South. So um, that is one of the silver linings that we have on very somber clouds, which uh, are otherwise uh, in, the, in the atmosphere. Uh, I'm going to come back to you on some questions around the Global Gateway Project, but I'm just going to come back to you a bit on that. Let me first turn to um, Senator Johnson Smith. Uh, Minister. Uh, let's go a little further back and let's go to the pandemic. Uh, let's go to the big challenge of access to vaccines that many of us faced. Uh, we used to watch, even in India, by the way, we, were, uh, we, took off, we took a little time getting off the block and then we caught up very quickly. But some months we could see vaccines being available in certain parts of the world, the first dose, the second dose, right? And, and we were watching that. Then you come to the conflict, the European conflict, which uh, Mr. Cremino spoke about. And you saw the energy shocks, the inflation, the food challenge, insecurity of a new kind. Mm -hmm. Are these the drivers of this new sense of community that we are seeing? Is, in some ways, has this ignited a 21st century moment uh, of, of approaching uh, multilateralism in, in some manners? Or do you think there is something different that is driving countries to work together. Uh, thank you for an excellent question. And before I answer it, I just want to start by commending the government of India on the amazingly bold step of, in a first past the post Westminster system, designing a legislative mechanism that allows for 30% of seats to be reserved for women. That is significantly more. <laughs> than the percentage that has been reserved on this stage. So <laughs> for us to vis visibly appreciate what is being done, uh, that is, uh, this is a microcosm of that. Uh, but just to say that, um, that I do think that the, the crisis which we face, the health crisis uh, during the pandemic, which really narrowed our recognition on who our friends were and who they are in the global south. It was an incredible, uh, a very focusing moment, especially for foreign ministers. You know, you were in a situation where you needed to call on friends for support. This is not a situation where there was a domestic capacity that could be mobilized. This was a scarce resource which everyone needed at the same time and in massive scale. Mm. You needed friendship. Mm. Who could you call? And more importantly, who would answer? Mm. India answered. India answered the world. India, India answered the small countries of the Caribbean. I have the Indian vaccine. I received it, one of the first uh, in Jamaica to receive it. Minister Jai Shankar answered the call of foreign ministers from near and far across the world and assisted in a great time of need. And um, it has focused our minds in such a practical way. It seems so long ago in many ways. So much has happened since, the conflict, etc. Mm -hmm. But it was deeply emblematic of how, how it is that you can't always count mm. on persons who you think you can. It brought a sense among the South of reliance among ourselves. 
a recognition not only in the complex way of looking at supply chains and deeper uh, issues that of course developed along the way, but quite simply, who will, who will help when help mm. is needed? Mm. And the answer was then India. That has been replicated in many ways, and it's, you know, it it's, can be broadly characterized as partnerships. When we look at broad issues, cross-cutting issues that affect us in the South, climate change, financing, mm. new technologies, uh, innovations that are going to help us to uh, change the way in which we deliver services to people, all of this, building human capacity, et cetera, these are partnerships which have existed with India from before. We have been uh, members of the Initiative for Resilient Island States, uh, which was uh, conceptualized by India, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, mm -hmm. again conceptualized by India, International Solar Alliance, again conceptualized by India. These were all pre-pandemic. So we were engaging in partnerships and recognizing where in the South uh, capacity, abilities, ideas, and institutions existed rather than relying on a traditional or perhaps even more proximate uh, <coughs> neighbor. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, while it is that the pandemic has focused our minds and made us more concentrated on the issue of reliance among ourselves, I do believe that India has been an incredible partner for quite some time in the South. Uh, whether you wish to term it global or plural, uh, those of us who are unified as having been colonized, uh, particular vulnerabilities usually characterized by mm -hmm. particularly high levels of indebtedness, et cetera. These are matters which we have all had to be, be grappling with for some time. And I must say that India has been an excellent partner quite through it. Minister, but you would agree mm -hmm. that uh, we still require an institutional framework. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is that we are partnering with the United Nations even for this evening. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do want uh, the apex global governance body to function. Mm -hmm. uh, can we flourish? Can we respond to the challenges? Can we serve aspirations of people unless we have the UN that works? Yes. My question to you would be, is it possible to salvage the UN? Uh, uh, let me give you an example. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you, I saw that you were like, yes, we can. So I just want to temper it. Uh, look, the last time we made progress in the most important reform that the UN must undertake, the Security Council reforms, was when you were in charge. Hmm. And since you left that role, uh, the file is not moved. What I will say is that uh, we must make the multilateral system work with the UN at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. Just like in trade, we must make the WTO. The WTO. We must make an international rules-based world order in which the WTO is at the heart of trade as the UN at, in terms of multilateral cooperation. Small countries like ourselves have no choice. Mm -hmm. That is the reality. Mm -hmm. There is no other system which will allow for a country of the size of a Jamaica, a Guyana, a St. Kitts Nevis, a St. Vincent and the Grenadines to have a voice in decisions that are made on matters that affect each and every one of our citizens. Mm. So it must work. We must right. fix it. We must reform it. And we must get the file moving. The fact is that we believe, we're members of the L69, that the Security Council should be expanded. We believe it's not representative. We believe that it should have an additional number of permanent members. Hmm. There should be a rotating seat for small island developing states. Africa should have a seat. Permanent members, such as those who are present today, should be represented. Hmm. Uh, and, and this, we believe, will assist in the decision making and perhaps unlock some of the deadlock that occurs within the system now. But it must work. Nothing else will provide a just, equitable, and uh, and responsive, it ha not, nothing else has the capacity to respond. And if we change one block of great powers for another block of great powers, where will small countries like us be? Thank you very much for that. And I, I think uh, this is something, again, I was talking to uh, our colleagues from the UN, that the importance of that organization mm. is actually one of the subterranean features of the communique that has come out. Mm. And we have to find ways of making development finance work, development institutions work. Absolutely. And maybe I'll turn to uh, uh, Minister Todd on this question, that be it the challenge of climate development or even fragile economies uh, that abound around the world today, from South Asia to the Caribbean to the Pacific, is the multilateral system responding to it? And how are countries 
finding ways uh, of of creating new fora, especially the smaller countries that you mentioned, uh, Minister. How are they finding different options and alternatives uh, to take on some of these big crises that confront them? Well, thank you very much for that question, and it's. I think everyone in this room here can answer that question, and we can go all the way back to the Kyoto Protocol, and you can see how it was dealt with. But if you look at human activity over the, the decades, and how many of the industrialized countries would have advanced their economies and done well for themselves, and now that we're at a period where Mother Nature is crying out, and we have to respond, it requires a collective effort. Um, and my colleague Kamina knows all too well, we, we are very low emitters, but we are punching above our weight within the multilateral system in terms of commitments. It, it requires a level of humility and an understanding that we all have to be involved. It cannot be left to one block or one country or one region. We all have to be part and parcel of this effort. Now, multilateralism is the key. And as Kamina would have mentioned, small states, that is, our, that is where we need to get our matters solved. But I would also add that even for large states, they'd also need multilateralism. With the forces that the globalization phenomenon was occasioned, no, no country, large or small, can survive in this international environment alone. You need, you need a global effort. You need global governance to work and to work for everyone. And if you look at it historically, and I'm just going back a little bit in history because history determines how you progress in the future. When multilateralism really took foot, we still had empires. We still had empires. Now we have nation states and we have some cities that can rival economies. The world has changed dramatically. Wealth creation, population growth, Big corporations, some corporations, total revenue, bigger than the size of many small economies. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that dynamic, you'll recognize that the institutions have to be now fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? You will need some amount of reform. And you know, <coughs> out of every crisis, you'll always find opportunities. And if you look at what we've gone through in the pandemic, and Kamina would have explained how India would have played this role, you look at the conflict in Ukraine and the G20 presidency, in India has emerged as a powerful leader and policy maker. And that is what you need, leadership. Multilateralism needs leadership. Mm -hmm. It lacks leadership. India is providing that leadership, and people are following. Countries are following. Civil society is partnering. Institutions are partnering. Because everyone wants the world to be a better place. And if any country with the size and capacity decides to take that leap of faith, you will get the support. And that is why India has been advancing steadily and progressively. And why is that? Because India, as a country, is extremely humble and extremely responsible. If you look at any of the nation states during the pandemic, they can tell you that they have received assistance from India. If you look at development assistance, you look at the small states, they can tell you, yes, we also got help. We also got assistance from India. And that is the kind of leadership that India has been provided without bragging or boasting, I might add. <clears throat> Quietly. Now what we're hearing India is because it's now, the, she's now at the helm. But India has always been providing leadership mm -hmm. without the Time magazines and the, you know, and the CBS nightly, what you call a weekly thingy. Mm -hmm. None of that. Quietly, India has been taken care of its people. 
and the rest of the world. So it's only natural that with all of that amount of work and time and energy, managing its own economy and giving assistance to the rest of the world, as we call it South-South Cooperation, India has earned its rightful place in helping not only to provide leadership in the Global South, but helping to advance integration among regions, and that naturally will take what have taken India to the multilateral level, because it all feeds into multilateralism. So we have to be, you know, we have to see it as, I was called the changing of the guard. That's what it is. It's India's turn, and India has proven itself to be a responsible and reliable <coughs> partner and leader. Minister, you also mentioned corporations no. and the changing nature of um, the economic landscape. Is it time for multilateral institutions to have more responsible roles assigned to these big corporations, making them responsible for meeting some of the objectives that we as a global community you know, I've, I've, I've always had this conversation because we deal in a world where politics and economics are interrelated. So we, we talk about the global political economy. Corporations have a responsibility. If you take the Fortune 500 companies, the first 20, all of our issues are, can be resolved. If you take the first 10 billionaires globally, they can fix hunger. What is causing us not to have the corporations get involved in bringing relief and partnering with institutions? What is causing, causing that? Is it profits? Is it the shareholders? Is it capitalism? I don't think so. I think there's a lack of engagement between the states and the corporations. We need to have everyone at the table, not operating in silos. And mind you, there are many corporations that do very well in terms of the corporate social responsibility, not, not knocking them at all. They do well. Billions they roll out in helping to bring relief to many countries in Africa and Asia but we need to bring everyone more together and more of them together and have an agenda where we can have a more meaningful engagement so that we don't have duplication of efforts. Because in many cases, many people are doing the same thing. If you see one person do one thing and it looks good, then you have persons following that. But how do we bring the institutions, the World Health Organization, and all of the institutions together with, in partnership with the corporations and then have a global rollout. I think it will be more effective that way. So I think that we need more engagement and partnership. Minister, you wanted to come in on this? Yes, just on, on the point of the um, provision of resources to get be behind the goals. Just that one of the things that uh, small countries have been calling for, and indeed many countries in the South have been calling for, is a reform of the international financial architecture. And this is based and grounded in a recognition that in 2015, the world signed on to the SDGs. We signed on to the 17 goals. We signed on to say this is, this is what we are going to seek to achieve by 2030. But we did so with an international financial architecture that remained structured in the way that it has been for so many years with uh, recognition that countries become ineligible for concessional financing or <coughs> grant funding if they are graduated on the basis of GND, GNP or GNI, sorry, or GDP alone. Not recognizing any matters in relation to human development, social development, any of their the, uh, deficiencies, indebtedness that they have had, vulnerabilities otherwise. And it's one of the reasons that we've said it, the systems need to be restructured to support the SDGs. Uh, we recognize the Secretary General has supported an SDG stimulus and put that forward, $500 billion each year to support implementation of the goals by countries not resourced to so do. This is something that Jamaica is fully behind, and we hope that other countries are as well. 
uh, but also to look at the, the, the fact that we, we need to ensure that the, <coughs> there is a consideration by the OECD and by other countries that allows access to financing on grounds that recognize vulnerability. So there's a multidimensional vulnerability index that is being considered by a high-level panel within the UN at this time, mm -hmm. uh, which considers different ways to look at whether countries should be eligible, as opposed to their GNP, uh, uh, GDP or GNI. And this is critical. We have to change how it is financing is, is undertaken in order to actually achieve the goals, quite simply. As the SG has said, Small countries don't lack ambition. They don't lack climate ambition. All they lack is, is financing. So that's where, where we need to be thinking, not about whether it's fair or unfair to have a goal. It is how are we going to get there and where are we going to get the funds to get there? And that and, needs to be done by reform. And as uh, Minister mentioned, mm -hmm. Minister Todd mentioned earlier, uh, reports tell us that three-fourths of all climate finance never leaves the country of origin. Mm -hmm. So basically, the frontline states that are battling climate change mm -hmm. don't have the resources, the firepower to respond to the challenge. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one key element that we need to think of. Uh, uh, Mr. Jayashankar, I want to come to you. Uh, and since uh, we have um, south of north, uh, <laughs> Portugal with us as well, uh, it, it's fair to ask a question, you know, uh, again, in that tour that I took to come to this place. Uh, in every third conference in Europe, they show that famous statement of yours. Europe's problems are the world's problems, and world's problems are not Europe's problems. <laughs> I mean, I know it by heart, right? So, uh, so my question to you is that some people think you're a bit tough on Europe. Is that a fair assessment? Nah. No, no, of course not. Um, <laughs> look, uh, that particular statement had a particular context, okay? And Let me tell you, they use it in every context. Okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, that context actually feeds into this conversation. Mm -hmm. Because if you, mm -hmm. look, uh, if you look at what happened at the G20, uh, part of the challenge in the G20 was actually to get the G20 to focus on, I mean, anybody who travels around the world today will tell you, list five big problems, mm -hmm. okay, which is troubling the entire world. Mm -hmm. I mean, people say probably debt. Okay. People say SDG resourcing. Mm. People say climate action resourcing. Uh, digital, uh, digital access, digital usage. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say probably could be nutrition, it could be gender, you know, one of these. Now, what had happened is, uh, if you see, uh, because of uh, partly COVID and partly because of the focus on Ukraine, these mm. subjects were driven out of the global conversations. So it took us an enormous effort to bring it back. Uh, you know, it is only by doing so that... To bring the focus back to issues that the G20 and the multilateral system were designed to... Well, respond. I put it this way. To get actually the G20 to talk about what the world wanted it to talk about. Mm. You know, mm. that, that was the real problem of the G20. And the way we could do it was to do this exercise, you know, I mean, Prime Minister put it very well. He said, first, let's talk to the people who are not going to be on the table. Mm. So that let's find out what they have to say, which is why we did the Voice of the Global South. Now, once we did the Voice of the Global South, I think it gave us uh, uh, the, the credentials, the uh, actually the empirical basis really to say, look, we've spoken to 125 countries mm. and this is really what is troubling them. Mm. And that is why we need uh, to focus, they, on, these uh, to, to focus yeah. on these issues. And uh, I, I am still, you know, I'm hopeful still because we still have another two, two and a half months of our uh, G20 presidency uh, that we will uh, get hopefully something uh, moving on the reform of uh, international financial institutions. Now, that That's uh, also one of the key areas that you are focused on, right, NDB reforms right, and development right. finance. So, so, in fact, if you look between SDG, uh, green development, uh, you know, women-led development, uh, the digital, digital public, public infrastructure, these are actually going to be the issues which will determine global progress for the next decade. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, now, now uh, you know, why I said I don't think I'm, I was, uh, uh, I'm, I am hard on Europe is I must also recognize at the G20 that a lot of the European countries, not just European countries, the other G, uh, G20 nations, um, uh, you know, once you kind of reasoned with them and focused uh, on them. I mean, I think everybody came on board. They responded. I mean, yeah. So it took, some, you know, it took a country or a set of countries really uh, to to make that effort uh, and bring global conversations back hmm. back uh, on track. So what all that I was trying to do was to gently suggest that global conversations <laughs> had uh, perhaps uh, needed a sharper focus. I, I, I think they took it to heart. <laughs> Apparently from what you say. Uh, Minister Gravino, what is the response in Portugal and other parts of Europe to this communique? Uh, do they see this as a positive for multilateralism, as a step forward for global cooperation to respond to these big challenges? Give us a sense of reroute from your continent. No, absolutely positive. Absolutely positive. I'd like to salute the work done by India, done by India's diplomacy, Dr. Jay Shankar. Uh, on leading G20 in this last year. Um, I, I think uh, that the point uh, raised here by, uh, by our Guyanese colleague is absolutely uh, correct. All of us need strong multilateral order. The big beasts of the jungle also need it. And of course, the small creatures of the ecosystem that we inhabit even more. But uh, without having uh, a number of institutional reforms, we are not going to have the world order that we need. The international financial uh, architecture is very much a case in point. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Security Council has been spoken about for far too long. And the point is that these institutions that underpin our order, there is a certain amount of elasticity in them and they, they can stretch, they can accommodate. But then at a certain point, they become brittle and snap. And uh, without reform, that is a serious risk that we are running. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, work uh, that is being undertaken in G20, in a G20 context, which is fairly representative, it's much uh, more representative, of course, than the G7, is very important to help refocus on precisely what we might be able to do to reshape institutions so that they correspond to the needs of the times that we are going through. One thing is for sure, the institutions of 1945 have reached the end of their elasticity. And without, uh, without some kind of reform, they don't work anymore. The international order isn't going to be there. I'm going to now turn to and the... Excuse me, if I can just wait one yeah, please, Of course, there, we have to look at what is good about the international order. And there, I would really emphasize the Charter of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. That is something that if we don't have that element, we can have some adjustment here or there. But if we don't have some, the Charter of the United Nations, there we are also in serious difficulty. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, our friends in uh, the audience, and I'm first going to acknowledge and invite His Excellency Khalifa Shaheen, Minister of State uh, from UAE, to speak to us. Uh, can, I, can we get a mic here, please? Yeah, you have. Thank you. You have a mic, please. I think it's on. Is it on? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I uh, have uh, prepared, prepared a written intervention, if you allow me to, to read. Uh, as long as it's a little brief, uh, it's not too long. Well, uh, because uh, it's a conversation, we don't want to uh, say it. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, <laughs> listen, let me start. Today, uh, we are here to discuss the rising role of uh, South in an increasingly fluid world where new actors are emerging and are increasing, making their voices heard on the global stage. This is an important and timely discussion to have right now. Uh, the international order is dealing with multiple concurrent developments and evolving challenges of, of varying intensity and importance, and with profound consequences on the world of states and populations. Many of the issues we face in today's international environment are global, transnational, and affect many aspects of our day-to-day -day lives. Thus, navigate through th those challenges with new types of dynamism, proactiveness, and openness to new forms of cooperation, 
uh, is, is important. The UAE is a believer in the necessity and validity of international cooperation and building strong partnerships with friends as well as with the multilateral organization. However, the geopolitical trend in today's world is in recent years has in many cases impacted the functioning of multilateral institutions, which has resulted in innovative types of diplomatic cooperative platforms in the form of small uh, uh, multilateral arrangements of partnerships such as the I2, uh, uh, I, uh, I2U2, such as uh, 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 the Quad, such as the AUKUS, etc. The BRICS is one of the successful examples of uh, as, as well. The UAE's inclusion in the BRICS group reflects its keenness to international and multilateral cooperation to achieve sustainable development. Minister, I'll have to interrupt you, but let uh -huh. me uh, use this opportunity to welcome you to BRICS. By inclusion of U UAE, Saudi Arabia, Iran, of course, this will bring the oil issue, but uh, I think the, the oil issue is, is also need to be, you know, a, a balancing uh, uh, factor you. rather than a division factor. Thank you. Um, uh, let me uh, turn to uh, uh, Dr. Alakija now. I, I, I saw her there, there in the audience. You have the mic with you? Go ahead. Quickly introduce thank you yourself very much. And, and um, thank you very much, Samir. First of all, I'd like to thank India for making the G20, G21. Um, truly, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, thank you so much. Um, that bold step at the G20, and I have been very practically there this year, and I've been very proud to have Africa's seat at the table um, for many of the meetings. Look, the change that we're talking about on a global level is systemic change. The entire system, ecosystem with which, within which we work and we exist needs to change. There's been references to the 1945 order. We must remember that the Bretton Woods institutions, 1945 was, was created to fix Europe. Unfortunately, it wasn't created to fix us. It wasn't created to fix the small island states. So we're in a really, it's time for that Bridgetown agenda. It's time for that new world order. And my question is, do the global, does global leadership have the courage to make that change? Or do, is it that we in the global south, and I love the, the Dr. Jay Shankar's sort of definition of what that is, that when you're in the global south, you know. So is it we who will have to force that change? Because this thing is broken and we need it, but we, we must somehow find a way to fix it. Thank you, Samir. I think that's a good question to respond. Do we have the political leadership today in the world to make those big changes? I'll come back to all of you for your final comments as we close, but let me turn to Ricky Cage. Ricky, Ricky is a Grammy Award winner and he's joined us this evening. Thank you, Ricky, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It's a huge honor to be here, especially, I have to mention that, uh, uh, especially in front of Mr. Jay Shankar, who I call the true rock star of India. <laughs> <laughs> all of us are fake ones. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to just speak a little bit about this, that most of, the, most of the nations in the global south have got ancient cultures, ancient traditions. And especially what is important for me is beautiful and rich musical traditions. And I believe that, uh, but when it comes to music globally, everywhere in the world, and these musical traditions talk about sustainability, they talk about mm -hmm. coexistence, mm -hmm. kindness, empathy, all of these beautiful topics which the world can learn from. But when you look at it globally, everywhere in the world, uh, the Western musical forms, whether it's classical music forms or whether it is pop musical forms are considered to be mainstream and all the music from the global south even though more people actually listen to it is considered to be ethnic or exotic music or Correct. you know niche music so i think there needs to be a lot more effort to mainstream forms of uh, music uh, i'm partial to the musical art form but the thing is that uh, there needs to be more effort to mainstream musical forms to show the collective power and the collective soft power of the global south because i think the world can learn a lot from it and uh, also, you know, I think uh, that's the best way to showcase the Global South, in my opinion. Thank you for that fantastic question, Ricky. Let me extend that. And, and, and the chair just one more thing, and yeah. mainstreaming cannot happen automatically. Yes. Mainstreaming effort. needs a lot of effort and it Correct. needs a lot of investment. It needs a lot of uh, a political will to actually do that. I think embedded in this is the whole notion that we have traditional knowledge. We have stories from the past that have told us about sustainable living. Have we chronicled those? Have we modernized those? Have we upgraded those? Do we use those? Or do we rely on 
uh, external conversations for our current music. I think that's a big question that Dickie is posing. But also the music is great, Dickie. So well done. Uh, uh, and let me, the final intervention is uh, Kezu Masali, head of digital programs at UNDP. Thank you so much, uh, Samir. And uh, thank you, Your Excellencies, um, for these riveting insights. Um, as a UN official, I think I can speak for many of my colleagues when we say that we're excited by these winds of change of the reform of not just multilateralism, but multilateral institutions. You've spoken about drivers like climate and digital changing the context of partnerships, the context of development. Uh, would love to hear more about how this might change the multilateral institutions and really, where does that change start? What can we do from, you know, as UN officials? Uh, some thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to come back to all of you. There's a question on digital climate. How are they going to change the institutions? What change is needed? Do we have the political courage and leadership to make those big changes? Um, to you, uh, Ambassador, uh, Minister Cravino, uh, Global Gateway, is it a great announcement or is it delivering on the ground? How can we make it? part of this whole new political architecture for the future. And of course, to uh, um, uh, colleagues from the Caribbean. Uh, and I must tell you that when I was speaking with uh, our minister uh, uh, about uh, this evening, when, we, uh, when he wanted to know who all are participating, and I, and I mentioned her name, he says, she has uh, Caribbean curtsy and grace. Oh. That was the term you used, I remember, uh, uh, Minister Jayashankar. We don't so, know if this is true, but I will accept it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so sorry, I just, I, I, I just wanted to tell you, I have so much trivia in my head that I sometimes have to share it. So, um, and, and so let me start with you, Ambassador Cravino, and then I'll come down the order. So let me start with you. Well, indeed, on the, on the global gateway that you mentioned, I think this is a very, very interesting opportunity. It's putting a lot of money uh, behind the notion that we need to, of course, we need to establish all sorts of different networks. Um, but that this needs to be done in dialogue, in intimate dialogue with uh, the countries involved. I think that is part of uh, uh, gaining this notion of um, uh, the need to uh, interact more closely with countries from around the world gaining traction over the past uh, few years. So I have uh, high expectations about Global Gateway. There's a lot of money there, and I think it can provide alternative solutions to, uh, to a rapidly changing world that needs uh, not to be drawn into networks that only interest a few. Uh, with, I wanted to make a, a point about uh, this question of the political courage that was raised. I had a professor, a wonderful lady at university, who uh, would always give us a very hard time whenever anybody, anybody used the term political will. Because behind political will are, of course, many interests, uh, intentions of, uh, of various sorts. And so to talk of political courage, undoubtedly there are moments when we need uh, outstanding leadership and that can make a difference. But at the same time, we need a transformation of the way that people view their own interests. And uh, a situation in which some have a large share of a pie but that pie is becoming increasingly threatened by an overheated oven. This is uh, something that you know, we need to be able to change the way people look, leaders look, countries look, public opinions look at the circumstances that we face. And that's the, the big challenge that we have at the moment. I'm sensing a change. Paradoxically, we have these terrible um, challenges to uh, multilateralism, but at the same time, we do have uh, the BBNJ treaty coming through. There are, there are um, aspects that give us hope. This uh, declaration that came out of New Delhi was a very positive one. I'm very glad to hear that Dr. Jay Shankar talk about intentions with respect to G20's approach to international financial architecture. So let's grab on to the possibilities that are opening up and to see and seek to transform the way that people look at the realities that we face. Minister Todd. Well, thank you very much. You know, as a small state, that's how, I, that's how I see the world. I see the world through the lens of a, a small state. When it comes to, when you speak about climate change, um, and we talk about transition to cleaner energy, 
Um, for us, we, we're, we're all on board with that because we have been punching above our weight. Mm -hmm. um, 2009, we have developed a low carbon development strategy which built sustainability into, into that framework, which we have now advanced to the low carbon development strategy 2030 agenda, which caters for the marine environment and the blue economy. As most of you may be aware, we have a standing forest that is the size of England and Scotland combined. Our forest sequesters 19.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide annually. We're now on the voluntary uh, carbon market. We are R3 certified. We've just uh, entered into an, ag an agreement with the HES Corporation uh, for $750 million over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and that accounts for 36% of our forests. So we still, have, we still have more forests for sale. We want to, that to be regularized. It has to have a global governance approach uh, because we believe that the standing forest is very important in mitigating uh, the effects of uh, climate change. Apart from the ecosystem of the ocean contributing about 64% of the oxygen, we think it creates a, a very good balance. So when it comes to the transition of it, for us, is the affordability. Mm -hmm. If we're going to transition to cleaner energy, into renewable energy, is the affordability for the developing countries mm -hmm. and for the small states. Same with digitization. This is the next wave of the industrial rep revolution. The cost. Access and affordability are critical. Yes, critical for small, for small countries and for the developing countries. And that is why we are very grateful, I should put it, that we have the leadership of India, because India has advanced exponentially in every aspect to be able to provide leadership that understands clearly our development challenges and how we need to fit within the global environment to be able to progress equitably. I'll just cut it there, because I know that we, we have no, thank time. You. Thank us. you so much, Minister. Uh, Minister Johnson Smith, I'll turn to you, and then maybe I'll turn to uh, the foreign minister to respond to all the research. So I'll first it. Thank you. Firstly, as the uh, home of Bob Marley and reggae music, which is the music <laughs> of liberation, there is no way that I couldn't agree with, empathize, and entirely support uh, the proposal that music exercises a soft power. That I, I have often been told that Jamaica is the only country that has invaded every country in the world without <laughs> one shot being fired. <laughs> and, and that is true. <laughs> indeed the soft power of reggae music so the the, the transformative power of music the wealth uh, of traditional knowledge that may even lie in a cannabis that now has to be rescheduled under mm -hmm. uh, you know pursuant to work by the cnd in vienna under the un convention and the system uh, we certainly seek to monetize transform with use of technology and to seek to spread the value of these matters. If I might just comment Please. very quickly. So on the Global Gateway, one of the, this is certainly one of the initiatives that does seek to bring private sector money into mm -hmm. areas which are generally risky and difficult to seek private sector investment. And we all know that public money will never be sufficient to deal with all of the issues that we have as small countries and indeed as developing countries. So, it is important that private sector funding be brought in and that creative and innovative solutions be fought. I think what is necessary is that the GGI, the, the Global Gateway, does not seek to insist on indebtedness as a part mm -hmm. of its structure. So, it can't be that you take a loan and invest as a, as a condition mm -hmm. if it is that you're seeking to pay down your debt. Mm -hmm. Jamaica is a country that's seeking to change its story. We inherited this administration a debt that was as high as 147% debt to GDP. Mm. And last month, we were at 78% and continuing on a downward trajectory without debt forgiveness. So we have taken a massive, very disciplined and strategic approach to how it is we can deal with changing our financial future. Mm -hmm. Part of that does require digital transformation, including delivery of our, um, changing how we deliver services to our people, et cetera, and bringing in private sector investment as well as international partnerships. 
And I say that to say that we, we are entirely, we believe in the Indian approach. We believe that in the global south, we cannot only see ourselves as victims of an unfair system. We have to develop, we have to innovate, we have to rely on ourselves. We have to determine new ways to do things, new partnerships, and find it within mm -hmm. and empower ourselves through music, through creativity, through our people who are our oil. We have to find new ways. And India has done it. Small country like Jamaica can change its story too. Guyana. We find our inspiration uh, in Vasudeva Kutumbakam. We find that India walks its talk. And we therefore are uh, very appreciative of the opportunity to participate in this discussion and to continue in this very um, important partnership for the Global South and indeed for Jamaica. And we thank you for having me on this panel well, as Thank well. you so much, Minister. Minister Jay Shankar, the final word from you this evening. Uh, you know, uh, the question on the political will. Mm. Uh, I think more than political will, there is political pressure for change. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a growing sentiment in the world and Global South in a way uh, embodies it. But there's also political resistance. Mm. You know, those who, who are occupying positions of influence, I mean, we see this in the UN Security Council most of all, uh, are resisting the pressure to change. Uh, those who are economically dominant today are leveraging uh, their, uh, their production capabilities. Uh, and uh, those who have institutional influence or historical influence have actually weaponized a lot of those capabilities as well. Hmm. So everybody is, you know, they will all mouth the right things. But the reality is still today, it's a world very much of double standards. Uh, we, I mean, the COVID itself was an example of it, uh, but uh, uh, I think you, we will, this whole transition will really be, in a sense, the uh, global south getting, uh, putting more and more pressure on the international system uh, and, uh, you know, the global north or the, I mean, call it whichever, it's not just the north, I think uh, there are parts uh, which may not think of themselves as the north, but are very resistant to change as well. So, uh, uh, so I, I think that's one uh, phen you know phenomenon we're going to see. The other question I also found very interesting because, you know, we've had to some degree. I mean, what we are talking about is political rebalancing. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had some economic rebalancing. After all, globalization has partly okay. helped that. The G7 has mm -hmm. yielded to some degree to a G20, but none of that really. Uh, goes beyond the point if there isn't cultural rebalancing. And cultural rebalancing really means recognizing the diversity of the world, respecting the diversity of the mm -hmm. world, giving other cultures and other traditions uh, their uh, due respect. And in fact, if I can just briefly go back to G20, you know, two, three very interesting themes of the G20. Uh, the whole idea of millets, ancient grains, was a very big theme. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of the Global South actually eats millets. Mm -hmm. Global South historically ate less wheat and more millets. But the mar market, because again, you know, in the name of the market, a lot of things are done. Like in the name of freedom, a lot of things are done. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so uh, the, the whole point is that uh, Actually, the freedom of expression also somewhere in the north. <laughs> uh, so, a lot of things so, are done. So, so look, the, the point is that uh, the, uh, uh, you know, it could be millets, it could be traditional medicine. Hmm. That somehow traditional medicine is deemed as some kind of eccentricity, you know, it's like hmm. some kind of superstition which you now try to put into a bottle and uh, make people take it. So, uh, respecting others' heritage, tradition, hmm. music, hmm. literature, uh, ways of life, uh, this is all part of the change which you know, the Global South would like to see. I think that's a... That's a... It's been a, it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, before I invite my colleague to propose a small vote of thanks and also offer each one of you a small memento from us to take back. Uh, I must plug uh, the work we did at the Think20 as part of the G20 through just some numbers. This year, in the last eight months, we hosted 65 
discussions like these in 16 cities in India and every and one country in every continent mm -hmm. as a think tank that struggles with budgets. We published over 350 policy briefs in these eight months, written by 1100 authors from 768 institutions around the world, comprising of 75 countries and 46% women authorship. Mm -hmm. India's G20 has made exotic mainstream. Global South is no longer exotic. Global South is the lounge that you want an entry to. And it's a members only lounge. You have to feel it to be in it. You can't acquire it. And I think that's the essence of this discussion that there is a new moment, a new mood. In 2009 at the Pittsburgh summit, a new economic coordination council was created, the G20, to save the banks and serve the rich countries. I think at the New Delhi summit, in 2023, a new body is being born that will serve the 7 billion people who had been invisibilized by the 1 billion who benefited from globalization. Mm. And I hope all of you will take this discussion forward into your offices yeah. and work to serve the last human on the planet that has aspires, uh, that aspires, that breathes, and that dreams of a better life. So please join me in applauding this wonderful panel <laughs> for their contributions. And let me... And let me invite my colleague Vinita to propose a, a vote of thanks and then our colleagues to present with a moment of ease. Thank you, Samir. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Reliance Foundation, I'd like to convey our heartfelt thanks to your excellencies, to the permanent mission of India to the UN, our partners, the Observer Research Foundation and the UN in India, and to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us for this event. This has been the second year of our annual India Spotlight during the UNGA. And this week, we've had an enlightening two days where we've not only been able to highlight some of the exemplary lighthouse initiatives from India that are contributing towards achieving the SDGs, we've also deliberated together on the new ideas and actions that will be needed post-2030 to consistently address the development challenges of the world. True to the spirit of the South Rising, these two days have been an excellent example of how India and countries of the global South can lead the way in strategizing the next phase of development and collaborate with the rest of the world to offer solutions that are innovative, equitable, inclusive, and sustainable. At Reliance Foundation, it's been our consistent endeavor to devise solutions that are in partnership with key stakeholders, especially communities, we care for the planet, our world, our global family, and these India Day gatherings are a testament towards our commitment towards continuing this journey, hand in hand with India's efforts towards creating a more inclusive world. We look forward to collaborating and continuing to collaborate with partners like yourselves across the spectrum of philanthropy, development, business, and academia to ensure that future generations can thrive. And we look forward to welcoming you all again next year to the India Spotlight during UNGA Week, where we will continue to showcase insights from India to tackle global development challenges. But this evening isn't over yet, and we hope you'll continue to join us um, in the next room for a networking dinner to continue these conversations. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you, Vinita. <laughs>